Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Dr. Mark Rudolph, Chief Experience Officer for Sound. Thanks very much for joining us for the COVID-19 clinical webinar. We've got a lot of very useful and practical information, so we want to get right into it. Just a couple of technical words. We encourage your questions, and we'll have a little bit of time for some Q&A at the end of the webinar. Also, your questions are driving the content of these webinars as well. So please go ahead and type the questions in the chat box at the bottom of the webinar control panel. Additionally, we are recording this webinar and we'll send an email to everybody that was invited when the recording has been posted on the Sound Institute later today. So without further delay, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. John Berkmeyer. Hey there, everybody. Good afternoon. This is John Berkmeyer. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer at Sound. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and more importantly, thank you for your commitment to our patients and our communities. Um, I know this has been a time of really high anxiety for you, for your families, for your uh, partners and uh, teams, so I, I just want to thank you up front for everything that you're doing. Um, I have the great pleasure of uh, introducing three of my colleagues who um, have prepared and will present um, what I think you'll find to be a very informative webinar on where we stand right now with regards to the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, Dr. Nate Ruck is the CMO for Emergency Medicine, Greg Johnson, CMO for Sound Hospital Medicine, and Sergio Zanotti, CMO for Sound Critical Care. Thank you guys and uh, look forward to the presentation. Thanks, John. Uh, this is Greg Johnson, the CMO of uh, Sound Hospital Medicine. Uh, I know that uh, we have gone through this agenda previously, and we wanted to make sure that we maintain the same uh, agenda, um, but also reiterating what Mark said at the beginning of the call, we want to make sure that uh, we are addressing um, questions directly from the field. Uh, I will also reiterate John's uh, gratitude and, and thanks to the field. Um, it, we will be saying that frequently and regularly because it can't be said enough. Um, uh, how much we appreciate everybody's professionalism um, and attention to detail and uh, willingness to engage uh, with our patients and hospital partners. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things that we wanted to make sure that was provided was just an update about how um, COVID-19 is affecting us organizationally. Um, we obviously recognize that cases are increasing across all service lines. Um, we've had uh, patients that have been uh, screened positive in our emergency departments uh, um, and obviously under the care of both uh, hospital medicine and critical care uh, clinicians alike. Um, in future webinars, we will be providing more detailed information. Right now, we're still in the process of gathering that, validating some of the data, but we intend to present it back to you just so that way you have an idea on the scale and scope that it uh, that the disease has within our organization specifically. Um, we're also maintaining the webinar as it was previously stated in that we will make sure that this is a weekly uh, entity, but also that we are going to have additional time dedicated to specialty specific communication. I know emergency medicine had theirs earlier uh, and critical care has one upcoming, but we want to reinforce what is at the bottom most significantly, which is we are most focused on what it means um, for our uh, individuals that are delivering care, um, directly accessing our patients. And so the entire organization is focused on this. We'll continue to discuss things clinically and address any operational concerns that will come up. Um, with that, I'll turn things over to Nate. Thanks, Greg. Nate Rook, CMO for Emergency Medicine here. So. I think we all know that there's really great evidence for widespread community transmission in the U.S. and that the strategy has really shifted from one of containment to one of mitigation and preparation. And as Sergio will expand on later, you know, really flattening the curve is a concept that I think we're all familiar with and will be discussed a little further in the presentation. There are over 4,000 cases in 49 states. West Virginia is the only state of the union not reporting a case. We really expect those numbers to increase dramatically, primarily because of increased availability of testing will give us a better idea as to what the true prevalence of disease is. We also believe that the, the disease burden is gonna to continue to be unevenly distributed. It's gonna be lumpy. There will be parts of the country where the healthcare system is gonna be stressed and challenged, and there will be other parts of the country where 
you know, the burden of disease isn't going to be that great. And I think, you know, that's certainly one of the things we're thinking about as we look to support the field is how do we distribute resources to the place, places that need them the most. The um, so about the virus, you know, like we discussed last time, and most of you are aware, this is a novel beta coronavirus. SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus, and COVID-19 is the World Health Organization designation for the disease name. And this is the third coronavirus pandemic of the 21st century. And since 2002, we've had much smaller uh, pandemics of SARS and MERS. Main mode of transmission is respiratory droplet. and I think that really is why proper PPE use is a, a theme that's going to be woven throughout this presentation and something that needs to be emphasized for everyone. And I know, you know, that's a, a topic that Sergio is going to expand on a great deal. We also know from an epidemiologic standpoint that the severity of disease in pediatrics, you know, in pediatric patients is not zero, but it's dramatically less. And really the risk of severe disease increases dramatically with advancing age. So testing. Over the subs in the subsequent weeks, we know that you know the prevalence of testing is going to increase dramatically, primarily because of a couple changes. You know, instead of testing being run centrally through the CDC and a few um, state health departments, it's going to become widely distributed. LabCorp and Quest Diagnostics have added the test to their test panels and high complexity labs at hospitals and elsewhere are going to be able to perform the test in-house in the coming weeks. It's worth having a little bit of discussion about the test characteristics. Now, it's important to remember this is a test that was distributed nationally through an emergency use exemption, and we don't really know exactly uh, what the test characteristics are, but we do know a lot about what polymerase chain reaction tests are like in other disease states and in other coronaviruses. And one of the things we know is that the negative predictive value is not tremendous. So especially as prevalence increases, if you see a patient that has the disease phenotype, even if they have an initial screening test that's negative, it's likely they have the disease. And the sensitive, sensitivity of the test based on some preliminary data may be in the 75 or 80% range. So it's very important to keep that in mind as we move forward. I think it's also important that we be good stewards of emergency department, hospital, and ICU capacity, and that we keep patients that are low acuity out of the ED and don't send them there for testing unless they require hospital level care. So our resource list has been updated somewhat from the last call last week. In order to access these hyperlinks and have them be active, you need to put the uh, slide deck in presentation mode. Then if you click on these, they'll take you to the WHO, the CDC, the third resource here is really one worth discussing a little bit, which is the University of Washington. You know, the Pacific Northwest is really the tip of the spear in terms of dealing with this challenge. And the University of Washington has made public all their policies and procedures. And the page that's linked to here is really valuable. And I think something that is worth taking a look at. The final link is to Sergio's excellent Critical Matters podcast. He's had two episodes on COVID-19, and they're both, I think, a must listen for anyone who's a frontline clinician. So without um, further delay, the next part of our presentation will be led by Dr. Sergio Zanotti, the Chief Medical Officer for Critical Care. Thanks, Nate. So before I start, I just want to echo the comments of my colleagues regarding how uh, grateful we are for all the great work that the, the, our, our co clin clinical colleagues are doing at the bedside. Um, there's still obviously a lot to be done, and uh, I think we cannot thank you all enough for taking care of our patients and helping our communities move through these very difficult times. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about clinical guidance and specifically focus on severe acute respiratory illness with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. And I think, like uh, Nate mentioned earlier, the ultimate goal that we have as a society right now in the United States and as a healthcare system is to flatten this curve. We know that we already have over 5,000 documented cases, which means that there are probably many, many more that have not been uh, documented or tested yet. And the whole idea is that by implementing appropriate identification of patients, quarantining them at home, 
social distancing and interventions in the hospital, we can actually flatten that curve as in a way that doesn't overwhelm the healthcare system. It, based on what has happened in Europe and what has happened specifically in Wuhan and China, there is obviously tremendous risk of uh, collapsing the healthcare system if we don't control this uh, epidemic and flatten that curve. So keep that in mind also when you're talking uh, with people in your community, with your families, with your friends, and really trying to make sure that everybody is conscious of why this is so important. In terms of uh, specific treatments, I would like to start with triage. And I think that for the initial part uh, of our approach to this epidemic, the containment phase, a lot of the triage was based on identifying risk factors related to travel history and contact uh, history with COVID-19 positive patients. As we move forward with community transmission, these are not going to be sensitive enough, and we have to be very careful in terms of understanding that there will be patients coming into our hospitals through the ED um, who will be very, very acutely ill and whom we might not get any history who are very likely to have COVID-19. So at this point, I think that when we walk into rooms, when we see patients, we should be suspecting COVID-19 in any patient with severe acute respiratory illness of unknown origin who's presenting with any of the following, a fever, a cough, or shortness of breath. So that is pretty broad. Now, let me clarify further what severe acute respiratory illness means. It means a respiratory illness that obviously has occurred, I mean, in, in an acute period uh, and that requires treatment in a hospital. So it doesn't refer to patients who need to go to the ICU exclusively. It requires treatment in a hospital. So somebody who comes in and requires oxygen, but it does not meet ICU criteria would still fall in this, in this category. As soon as we have a suspected COVID patient, the most important step is to apply appropriate infection prevention and control. So we first deal with the source, which is the patient in this case, and initial source control is placing the surgical mask on a patient. And I can't overemphasize this in terms that I still have seen in many hospitals, this is not, not occurring immediately. This should be the first reaction that we have placing a surgical mask on that suspected patient, and that is considered source control and actually it mitigates the risk for others significantly. Um, the second thing that is recommended is that all these patients uh, have a droplet and contact precautions to all suspected and confirmed patients. These would be ideally in single, in, in, in single rooms. Uh, as numbers increase in some hospitals, that might be, uh, they might be out of capacity of single rooms and some hospitals in some of the most affected areas in the United States, but also uh, elsewhere in the world, have then moved to cohorting, cohorting patients with COVID-19 as a measure. Airborne precautions, which is uh, considered, I mean, um, air uh, uh, negative pressure rooms is something obviously that very quickly hospitals are running out of. Um, there is significant um, concern that there are certain procedures that are much higher risk, and you'll hear about this over and over again, but really those are procedures that uh, are associated with a generation of aerosols of these droplets. And what the CDC and what the WHO is saying is, if you have negative air, air, airway rooms and you can do airborne precautions, do it initially. But as those um, resources are gonna be limited and you're, you're, you run out of them, then what they're asking people to think is to be judicious and prioritize airborne precautions, so negative pressure rooms and N95 respirators for the people doing the procedure for those situations associated with high aerosol generation, which includes intubation, also extubation, non-invasive ventilation, which is not highly recommended, including BiPAP, bronchoscopy, which is not recommended in these patients, and CPR situations. And we'll talk more about these in a little bit. What about infection prevention and control for the providers and the personal. I think that the most important thing I wanna emphasize is that extra layers of protection are not gonna help you if you do it wrong. And extra layers of protection can also be associated with a higher risk of, a, of contamination. So let's focus on what's currently recommended and doing that well. Number one, frequent deliberate hand washing. What do I mean by deliberate hand washing? It's using soap and water for 20 seconds or more, making sure you cover all parts of the hands, including your thumbs. 
or using an alcohol-based product with 60% more of alcohol, again, for 20 or 30 seconds, and making sure that you cover all parts of the hands. And there are some excellent videos that we have shared that actually show you the proper sequence of a, what we consider adequate or effective hand washing. The second point is wearing appropriate personnel protective equipment, also known as PPE. And I'm gonna review that in a little bit more detail. This is a, a document that you can obtain by, by going to that link. And basically, you have to be very deliberate when you put these on and when you remove them. You wash your hands first, you put the gown on first, you put either a surgical mask or a respirator if you're gonna be involved in an airborne situation or doing a high aerosolized um, a situation. You then put your, your, go your safety goggles or face shields. I think most hospitals are probably using disposable face shields. And last, you put on your gloves. Ideally, you should remove these in the, uh, uh, before you leave um, the room, unless you're in an airborne room in which you would re remove them in the ante room. And the proper se sequence again here is, you can even wash your hands with alcohol, even if you have gloves on to start with, and that will decrease self-contamination. You then remove your gloves and your gown together, being very careful how you do that. After that step, you wash your hands again, you remove your goggles or your face shield, you wash your hands again, you remove your mask or respirator in the right way, you wash your hands again, and then finally when you, re when, when you, when you re leave the room and have, after disposing these in the, in the appropriate trash can with care, you wash your hands again. So I think that I can't overemphasize how important doing these simple steps right is gonna be for the protection of our providers. And I think as leaders at the bedside, we should be helping people understand this and being safety buddies to others in terms of making sure that they're doing the right, the right steps. Now, uh, we can go to the next one. There are certain situations that are gonna become more and more difficult. I think that it is very different when you walk into a room of a patient that you have identified as a COVID-19 patient, but all our, our clinicians, where you're in the emergency department, on the floors as a hospitalist or in the ICU, may be called to respond to an emergency in a code blue or rapid response in patients in whom we don't have a lot of information. And I think that we have to be very careful. There are a couple of things that I think we can do to mitigate our risk. Number one is I think there has to be excellent communication between our hospital teams and our ICU teams in terms of recognizing Patients who are outside of the ICU or who might require a rapid responses or code blues or intubations. And these are patients who usually have or increasing oxygen requirements or whose requirements are above 50% to keep us at uh, above 90. These patients uh, very quickly can deteriorate. So identifying them and being proactive about doing things in a more controlled fashion might be a good way to go. Um, also, unknown situations, people run into situations where they run into a patient that was admitted for something else, and then after you do all the procedures, you find out that they, were, they had a fever, they had respiratory issues. So I think that in unknown situations, if you're going to be in a high aerosolized situation, which is intubation and CPR, be a little bit uh, careful. Number two, I think, is when we get to the situations, or even if it's a known patient, a quick huddle with proper social distancing is important, but making sure that we have an inside team and an outside team. The outside team provides support to the inside team. There are certain tasks that can be done from the outside um, without exposing a whole bunch of people to the patient. We're trying to control the crowd, minimize the amount of people interacting with the patient, and we should have a quick plan by the leader of what we're gonna go in and do. Once we are inside the room taking care of that patient, as I said, proper PPE, PPU, PPE use. In these patients, ideally, we would want to have N95s. Um, CPR, there are some societies that are recommending that if the patient's not intubated or before they get intubated, that we proceed with chest compressions only. Now, as you know, there's data in the, in the field that ultimately what really matters here is chest compressions but we should uh, make sure that we intubate those patients as quickly as possible with the right precautions. Regarding intubation considerations, uh, this is a high aerosolized situation. N95s would be, I mean, required in addition to the face mask, the gowns, 
and, and, and gloves. We have recommended the use of rapid sequence intubation in all these cases, minimizing, minimizing bagging as much as possible, um, and also making sure that we're using video lar laryngoscopy uh, or um, CMAX or glide scopes uh, and moving very quickly to an LMA if we have any difficulty and really trying to control that airway as quickly as possible which means that also the most experienced person will be intubating. So these are some of the considerations. There's a lot of this, I mean, uh, out there, we're gonna share more information, but please, I think, take the time to plan a little bit and think about what are the most important simple steps that we can do to optimize the results for our patients, but also to protect the, 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 the medical staff as we encounter these situations. In terms of diagnosis, I think that um, their cultures are really important. I mean, we're going to be dealing with a lot of patients who have unknown causes. So we still want to make sure that we're checking for blood cultures, for, for bacterial micro, uh, pathogens, that we're checking other viral uh, panels, that we're doing that as soon as possible. In terms of COVID, um, as Nate explained with the um, rapid uh, RT, uh, reverse trans, uh, transfer phase um, uh, test, testing you need swabs that can are best obtained from the upper and lower tract to improve, I mean, the yield. Uh, other labs that have been noted that uh, are very commonly seen in these patients, lymphopenia seems to be a very common presentation. Uh, the most common finding in these patients on laboratory, even in the presence of mild um, uh, leukocytosis, so that relative lymphopenia is important to recognize early. Procalcitonin is normal in these patients, most often reported. And I think that's important in terms of identifying other pathogens in the initial workup. Uh, but also I think it's important later on if we're caring for patients who are very sick and they deteriorate and the procalcitonin now goes up in a COVID-19 confirmed case, it might be an indicator of a super infection or a nosocomial infection. So I think that this can be very helpful. And LFTs are uh, associated in 30% of the cases with elevations anywhere from two to four times normal. So that's something that's also been reported uh, quite a bit. In terms of imaging, the x-ray, which is most commonly done, will show bilateral diffuse uh, consolidations and ground glass opacities. Very early in the disease, the findings might be minimal or none, but they can progress very quickly, just so you're aware. Uh, routine CAT scans are not recommended. Some people are saying that because of some reports from China, the CAT scan has a better predictive value that we should be doing CAT scans, but it's not recommended because it won't change your management and it will expose others and ultimately ties up CT scan from people who might be needing it. And as the numbers increase, all these things get exponentially more complicated. So if you have a patient with fever, infiltrates, and lymphopenia, you should be thinking COVID-19 right now. This is uh, from the one paper that was published in Lancet Infectious Disease. Uh, that showed 81 cases with the radiological findings in China. And as you can see, this is a patient that I think was a 70 year old patient. Day five, there's minimal ground uh, glass opacities, then you ground glass uh, 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 changes. Then you can see by day 15, there's consolidation and increased ground glass opacities. And by day 20, this is a non survivor. You can see very, very dense consolidations in the bases and really a typical picture of diffuse infiltrates uh, with ARDS. The main stain of treatment is going to be supportive. We start with supplemental oxygen therapy, targeting a SAT above 90%. For most adults, if they're pregnant women, we would target higher at 92 to 95%. I urge everybody, uh, ED, floors, and ICU to be very careful and cautious with non-invasive ventilation, especially in the form of BiPAP. A misfit mask and problems with, uh, with, with fit can generate significant aerosolization of droplets, uh, number one. Number two, in non-invasive modalities have been associated with high failure rates in these patients, and in series that have come from China have been associated with increased risk of death, uh, which are attributed to delays in intubation. So I think that the role of non-invasive ventilation is probably going to be lesser in these patients and that we have to have all these considerations in, into place. Uh, just So just I urge you caution as, as we approach these patients 
as it may be a little bit different than some of the other patients that we've treated in the past. Fluid management, if these patients are not in shock and as they're stabilized, conservative fluid management is recommended. Even information that we're, we're, we're receiving from colleagues within sound treating these patients already in terms of trying to get them off the ventilator, really working on a conservative strategy and even diuresis after they're stabilized has been shown to, to help with oxygenation and moving these patients along. So really try to avoid fluid overload uh, as much as possible. Antibiotics, uh, these patients uh, require early uh, empiric antibiotic as with our sepsis protocols. There's not a lot of good information on co-infections or, or super infections early on, but since most of these patients we're unaware of what else is going on or what's going on, it is recommended that we start early empiric antibiotics for community acquired pneumonia. Uh, something that has been uh, discussed a lot in many forums, and there's papers now recommending this, is uh, to not use corticosteroids. The initial experience in, uh, in Wuhan, uh, they used a lot of corticosteroids trying to modulate inflammation in ARDS. Now, the based on findings there and other studies, it is really felt strongly that it's more likely to cause harm than, than potential benefit and it's, rec it's recommended against its use. Now, if you have a strong indication for steroids for another clinical indication in that patient, that's a different situation. But in terms of using steroids to treat the ARDS and as part of the treatment for all patients, it is not recommended. Monitor the respiratory status closely. These patients do seem to deteriorate very quickly. Like I said earlier, low threshold for intubation for three reasons. Number one, high failure rate with other delivery oxygen methods when they are getting worse. Number two, we definitely want to take, take a control of that, of that airway as soon as possible. And, and doing that in a more planned way is probably safer for patients and for healthcare providers. And number three, there's been associated increased mortality with delays in intubation in those in, in patients that have been treated so far with COVID-19. Do not intubate without the proper PPE. Proper PPE for this situation for the person intubating includes an N95, like we said before. And if possible, these are the procedures you want to be doing in your negative pressure rooms. Now, the reality is that if we get overwhelmed with cases, that might not be possible. So using the N95s in these situations as a priority is gonna be very important. Other comments on intubation and mechanical ventilation. I already mentioned this earlier. Rapid sequence intubation is recommended. Minimize bagging and uh, use a glidescope or CMAC in order to minimize operate exposure to droplets. Uh, these patients, once they get intubated, should be placed on ARDS net protection lung ventilation. And uh, that means uh, anywhere from four to eight, usually six, kilograms per predictive a predictive body weight of tidal volume and trying to keep their plateau pressures below 30. A prone position has been demonstrated uh, as a tool that can decrease mortality in severe ARDS. The report so far is that COVID-19 patients have good responses, great re good responses in terms of oxygenation to prone positioning. And more and more official statements are recommending the use of prone positioning for these uh, sick patients with COVID-19 and ARDS. In some cases, uh, neuromuscular blockers, and there seems to be a smaller role for ECMO, but that would only be recommended for centers that routinely do ECMO, and they would apply the same criteria they apply in other instances. In terms of specific treatments for COVID-19, I want to be very clear, there are no specific treatments approved for COVID-19. And uh, you're going to see a lot uh, being circulated, a lot being discussed, and I think that we have to be very, very careful here. And let me explain what is being discussed and why we, we need to be careful. Number one is that some patients have received remdesivir, even some sound patients. And this is an experimental broad spectrum antiviral that's available from the manufacturer on a compassionate basis. It was developed for Ebola and seems to be scientifically the most promising agent. I think that the compassionate use basis or avenue eventually will close. And now there are three separate NIH randomized trials uh, 
um, one that is an NIH adaptive trial that is looking at remdesivir for severe cases, and two, Gilead, which is a manufacturer of sponsored trials, one for severe cases in the ICU and one for less severe cases. And I think that if we're seeing a lot of these patients, we should really try to uh, get expedited approval at our IRBs and, and, and include our patients in these trials so they can receive these drugs and we can actually get information that is useful for the future and that is done in a controlled fashion. Other drugs that people have mentioned, lopinavir and ritonavir, which is Kaletra, has been reported in a small series. We do not know if it works. There are some trials going on as well. I think that we should try to do them through trials. It's considered experimental by WHO and by CDC. Uh, the difficulty with this drug is that uh, once the patient's intubated, you can't uh, use one of them and you need both of them to work. But again, there's no proven uh, study that really demonstrate that this would be utilized. And I think it's hard for us with the number of patients that we have to make recommendations on things that are unproven and that can have uh, consequences downstream as we'll talk in a second. And finally, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, also known as Plaquenil, uh, are being talked about as a potential treatment. The only reason is because there's one in vitro study that showed that it, it inhibits the virus growth. Now, from an in vitro study to clinical benefit, it's a long, long road. And I do believe that there are potential consequences, hypoglycemia, there are potential consequences such as a prolongation of QT, which is very worrisome, especially with reports of patients developing arrhythmias and dying from them. So I think that if we start utilizing drugs that are not proven in an epidemic, we can potentially uh, magnify any harm that we have not identified by a factor of a thousand X. So I would uh, uh, really requ uh, request that we are very, very cautious and that we are very thoughtful of trying to achieve the greatest good for the greatest amount of people in a scientific way. Finally, some clinical pearls. The medium time from onset of symptoms to ARDS is around eight days. The medium time from ICU to death and those who did not survive is around seven days. Some high risk of death factors include older age. So there is an increased risk of death after 60, 60 to 69, 4.5% death, 70 to 79%, 8% plus minus, and above 80, 15% death. A comorbid conditions, specifically underlying heart disease, hypertension, uh, diabetes, have been associated, immunosuppression have been associated with increased mortality, and uh, also findings of a D dimer greater than one microgram per liter in the ED, and the increased SOFA scores have been associated with increased mortality. Uh, these patients can develop other problems, acute renal failure, abnormal liver functions, and cardiomyopathy plus arrhythmias have all been reported. Uh, renal failure and abnormal liver functions in up to a third of the patients, and there's increasing uh, interest in the severe cardiomyopathy that some patients are exhibiting, which has really, I mean, been described many, many years ago and, and by many people in septic shock as well. It's a sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy, but it can be very severe, might require supportive therapy. Um, the last thing, uh, before I go to mortality, I wanted to, to touch base because I get a lot of questions about this, and I think it's going to be very important for our hospitalist colleagues. Regarding non-steroidal NSAID use, there is one uh, recommendation from the Ministry of Health in France based on observations that they believe indicate that there's increased uh, death in patients who utilize non-steroidals. It's based on observational data. It's based on a Twitter um, post. I think that we have to be very cautious with observational data. Um, there might be other reasons might, you might choose to use Tylenol, but there also might be reasons why Tylenol might be complicated with abnormal liver function. So I think that we need more information on that. And then the other uh, post that I heard seen a lot is concerns of ACE inhibitors and uh, ARBs. Uh, there is no data absolutely that these uh, are associated with worse outcomes. There is one uh, correspondence who's proposing a hypothesis in Lancet that got published, and that has driven a lot of people to believe that we shouldn't be given ACE inhibitors or ARBs. There is an official statement 
from the Hypertension Council of the Amer uh, European Society of Cardiology that very strongly advises against stopping ARBs and ACE inhibitors in patients who need them because there's absolutely no scientific data that they're associated with harm in patients with COVID-19. Most of the severe cases have high mortality. There's been a lot of discussion in some forums of um, early uh, goals of care discussions with these patients, but I think that we're gonna need to learn more about that as things go, go forward. But the, the treatment is 100% supported. So I think that uh, without anything else, from a clinical perspective, till we have questions, I'm gonna send it back uh, to Nate. Thanks, Nate. Thanks, Sergio. So <clears throat> dovetailing on what Sergio said, you know, let's talk a little bit about guidelines for clinicians that are exposed, because I'm sure this is on the mind of everyone who's entering the airspace of a hospital. And really, you know, fundamentally, there's two things that need to be emphasized. One is source control, you know, masking patients with a cough, being mindful of the utilization of non-invasive ventilation in the form of, you know, BiPAP and high flow nasal cannula. And two is using appropriate PPE. And the CDC has guidelines which have been uh, simplified so that the exposure categories dovetail more with real world exposures. And you can find those by utilizing the link at the bottom of this slide. The link above the CDC link is something that's worthy of a little bit of discussion. The Annals of Internal Medicine published a, a brief research report, which is interesting because it's a report from a hospital where a patient presented with a severe pneumonia before the diagnosis of COVID-19 was really known or suspected. And this is not a patient that had traveled to China, really had no risk factors. He was admitted to the hospital with hypoxia with a presumptive diagnosis of pneumonia. And over a several day period in the hospital, deteriorated from a respiratory standpoint, required non-invasive ventilation. He was then intubated and the intubation was difficult, required the use of a bougie, at least two operators in a video laryngoscope. He then had a prolonged stay in the ICU. He improved, was discharged to the floor from the ICU. And while he was on the floor, just prior to discharge, you know, the, the idea that he could have had COVID-19, you know, was that, that was added to the differential and he was tested and he was positive. So the, you know, the healthcare providers that had had exposure to this patient were then, um, you know, enumerated. And there were 41 healthcare workers that were defined as having high risk exposure to aerosol generating uh, procedures. And the way they define this for the purposes of this study is 10 minutes at a distance of less than two meters from the patient. They then placed all 41 of these folks in quarantine and they tested them with PCR on days one, two, four, five, and 14. And all the swabs were negative. And these were healthcare providers who were protected, 85% of them were protected using only a surgical mask, not an N95 mask. And I think what that underscores for me is, you know, the importance of mindful and judicious use of, of PPE and how much that can protect you in the event of even a substantial exposure. This patient had very poor so source control. So when we combine source control with judicious use of PPE, we can really mitigate the risk to ourselves, to our patients, and to our families. So moving on from that, what can you do to prepare at you know, your site? And I think the really the first thing that's foundational and critical is participating in facility level planning. You know, I think every hospital has had their uh, priorities re-triaged and most have preparing for um, this epidemic front and center and making sure that you're a part of that. Number two, one of the things that, you know, is a significant risk is having staffing issues due to clinical colleagues that are infected, clinical colleagues that are quarantined, clinical colleagues that, you know, are, aren't able to present to work for whatever reason. And it, at the site level, I think it's critical that leadership have a roster of all credential providers and have thought through before the need is required you know, where are, what are alternative labor sources? Are there multiple hospital medicine services in the hospital that could potentially cross cover each other? In the ED, are there family practice physicians or surgeons that can assist in seeing ED patients? You know, what's happening more broadly with the medical staff at the hospital? Have they canceled elective procedures? Does that free up anesthesia staff or nursing labor that could be utilized elsewhere? You know, these are 
resources that can be allocated in a time of stress, but really only if the planning occurs in advance. The second thing, or the third thing that I think is important is to reach out to service line leaders at peer facilities in your community. And there are a number of reasons for this. You may get a better handle on the presenting patterns of patients. You might get a better understanding of resources that are available. It's just a great idea to coordinate with local healthcare providers. And as a site level leader, even if these aren't sound physicians, it'll give you the opportunity to have a finger on the pulse in terms of what's happening in the community. The final and, and really, or the second to last, and really one of the most important things, or perhaps the most important thing, is to keep an eye on each other and round on your frontline folks. This is stressful and anxiety provoking. Taking care of these patients is you know, an order of magnitude more difficult than what we already do, which is not easy. So making sure we support each other. And if you need something at the site level, make sure you, you ask for it. Finally, and we spoke about this earlier, keeping low acuity patients out of the hospital and out of the ED, making sure that you get in front of skilled nursing facility medical directors so that they keep possible COVID patients who don't require hospital level care in place, making sure that the primary physicians are not sending patients to the ED for testing when they don't need hospital level care. It's critical that we preserve elastic capacity in the form of ICU beds, inpatient hospital beds, and ED so that we can care for surges of patients when they arrive. All that being said, I'm gonna pass it on to Greg Johnson, who's gonna start off by talking to us about discharging patients. So thanks, Nate. Um, and you know, bringing up the connection to the community and um, really being aware of how we can manage bed capacity is uh, a critical consideration uh, for all of us, but particularly for our hospital medicine folks. And I know we received a handful of questions about what do we do with these patients because they're in, um, in some instances, um, either the patient has come from a skilled nursing facility or um, there are families that are concerned about um, uh, hospitalization and subsequent exposure um, uh, to other members of their, uh, you know, other family members once discharged. Um, there's not a lot of information. First and foremost, most of the information that uh, is available is uh, akin to what Sergio presented earlier, um, specifically about um, the virus itself, um, treatment protocols, et cetera. Um, for the link that is attached here uh, does address um, the CDC's recommendation, and below is actually the European Centers for Disease Control um, recommendation about um, what should happen with uh, uh, COVID-19 um, patients when they are prepared for discharge. And the first thing that everyone should know is that um, the CDC's recommendation is if a patient is clinically stable to be discharged, they should be discharged. Um, if they can go home, um, then the typical social distancing um, uh, protocols recommendation of increased uh, frequency of hand washing um, uh, all make sense. There, I would want to make sure that you refer back to the CDC with respect to very specific recommendations on when, uh, dis, uh, when COVID-19 isolation protocols should be discontinued. Um, but as you can read here, there um, is recommendation that there is 14 days of isolation afterwards with subsequent monitoring. Um, the patients uh, are, again, continue with um, masks and uh, are isolated as possible um, and limited uh, contact with additional family members. Um, this can be discontinued um, based on, you know, lack of symptoms specifically, um, no additional fever, um, and uh, respiratory status deemed back to normal. But again, the clarification of what that is, is hasn't been specified within the CDC or ECDC guidelines as of yet. Um, one of the indications, and again, part of the reason we placed the link um, within this particular slide is to underscore that um, there should be work within, with skilled nursing facilities as um, with respect to 
isolation protocols that should occur for patients that are discharged back to those facilities. Um, and you know, again, from Nate's prior slide in terms of being prepared, we want to underscore that there should be work in terms of making sure that the caregivers at the um, receiving facility um, are either limited or isolated to a specific unit um, and there's limited exposure to other patients. Um, everything that is available so far says that these patients can go back to facilities. And while I know that people are looking for guidance on how to get the facilities to receive these patients again, one of the things that I would underscore is that is going to require uh, collaboration with our hospital partners um, and with uh, public health entities to make sure that we can maintain inpatient capacity while we're trying to work through this uh, existing situation. Next slide, please. The other piece that Nate brought up, and I wanna make sure that people are aware, is um, uh, exists as a response from our organization and understanding that staffing is a significant concern for everyone, is that our telemedicine team has developed a rapid deployment program um, I know that this is listed here um, in terms of email, but I can assure you that your regional medical directors and regional CMOs are um, in pretty consistent contact in identifying sites that may need to have this up and running. Um, we can have telemedicine available in as soon as 72 hours in particular instances. Um, we are, in particular instances, we're looking at opportunities to screen patients in the emergency department. Um, and obviously, we're looking at this as a way to mitigate um, exposure risk for uh, our uh, sound clinicians, as well as clinicians within um, our partner facilities. Finally, I want to make sure that we're obviously leaving time for questions, but um, what Nate stated can't be stated enough. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we are paying attention to clinician well-being and making sure that we're supporting each other. Um, we want to make sure that you have the capacity to continue to round, um, uh, that our leaders have the capacity to round on uh, our team members, both uh, here and abroad. Um, we are reaching out to individuals um, that are traveling uh, internationally and asking them not to do so, um, where uh, when we are aware that they are um, uh, not, a, that when we are aware that they're not present, um, but also making sure that we know that um, they have organizational support. And if there are additional questions, that they can reach back out to um, the regional team members. If there are care specific cases that are bringing concern, then reaching out to the peer support program and obviously reaching out to the employee, employee assistance program um, if there are any other uh, concerns about individual well being. Um, with that, I will turn it over um, to Mark, uh, and uh, we should be receiving some questions. Thanks, guys. Fantastic presentation. We've got a fair number of questions, and I want to reassure people we'll make every effort to answer. Some of these questions are a little bit involved, and so we may just email you directly with some responses. Um, but let's let's get to the first question. Should almost anyone presenting with asthma or a COPD exacerbation be treated as a COVID-19 suspect? So I think that um, it depends, I think, what's going on also in, in, your, in your local community. But as as there's more of this spread, the way I would think about it is why did they have an exacerbation, right? So uh, one of the most common causes of exacerbations is viral infections. And from that perspective, I think that you should be thinking that this could be COVID-19. And uh, for our hospitalist colleagues, I, I wanna also share with you that a similar situation could occur with somebody with DKA. Why do they have DKA, right? Usually there's a, there's a precipitant in our practices. We almost assume it's because they didn't take their insulin. But if they were taking their insulin and all of a sudden they, they started seeing their sugars go up, there has to be a cause. And again, a common cause would be viral infections. And I think these are definitely in, in situations where we have community transmission, something that we should be worried about. So I think that um, there are still small pockets in the United States that maybe are not having that documented community transmission, 
but for most cases, you should be thinking that this potentially could be COVID-19. And that's where testing is gonna be very important, right? Because if you treat their asthma, their COPD, and they get better very quickly, and you can get a turnaround test very quickly, you might feel much more confident that it's not COVID. But uh, um, I think that at this point, it, I would be thinking COVID-19 is a potential cause of their exacerbation, absolutely. So on a related note, there's a, a question with a somewhat specific clinical scenario, which I'll just summarize, but an elderly patient with COPD who's short of breath, initial testing, including COVID testing is negative, chest x-ray is negative, patient deteriorates from a respiratory standpoint, patients being treated empirically with antibiotics, oxygen, et cetera, cultures are drawn. Question is, if COVID testing is done initially in a negative, given the relatively low sensitivity, should COVID testing be routinely repeated on patients like this? So I, I want to use the, the word routinely, but I think that if the patient is deteriorating and you initially had a COVID negative uh, test, especially early on, it probably uh, would be uh, uh, something I would consider and recommend it. Okay, thank you. Next question. We are being told at our site that high flow oxygen does not create aerosolization. The PPE recommendations are surgical masks. Can you clarify this? So uh, a lot of the high flow oxygen delivery systems that we use today um, are less likely to cause aerosolization. Uh, part of also, uh, and there's still recommendations that say to, you could use it in selected cases, but I think that the other reason why people have uh, talked about caution with this is because uh, there's been a, a high failure rate as we escalate oxygen um, supply. So if they have more and more oxygen requirements and you're going from normal oxygen to high oxygen to uh, very quickly, those patients might be at risk and might need to be intubated. But I think it has to do with the delivery that you're using for your high for your high flow oxygen and some of the newer ones i know that in the australian new zealand icu uh, societies uh, recommendations they do mention that some of the newer ones that they utilize do not produce that situation but i think that uh, without knowing more details it's hard to say in general i think i would i, I would i would caution not saying you can't use it but i would be very cautious with that Okay. If a clinician has a COVID-19 positive test without symptoms, can he or she continue to take care of patients? Uh, so as of now, you want to take that one, Gregor Nate? I was going to say, uh, given the fact that um, we are recommending that if a physician has a COVID positive test and has not been quarantined by the hospital for any particular reason, we are asking that they continue to deliver care, understanding that they should undergo all of the precautions that were previously outlined. If the hospital has a specific procedure or requirement of quarantine, um, then we work through the hospital's process. Um, but if the hospital doesn't have an existing process, then we are making. Then we are asking that they continue to deliver care, primarily as long as they are asymptomatic. If they develop symptoms, then they should go into quarantine. It should, and then go through the routine protocol. Okay, thank you. There are a couple of post-acute providers who have submitted questions about what the approach should be to a sniff patient that has any symptoms that are flu-like, coronavirus-like, um, who, sh who should be referred for testing in this high-risk population? So I, I don't think that we have clear guidance of uh, who should be referred for testing in terms of just a, the SNF population. I do believe that um, they are also at risk because we don't know who's visiting them and there might be community spreads. And we've seen, I mean, definitely uh, in nursing homes and other uh, long-term care facilities, there's been a significant uh, number of patients. I think that um, the ideal situation, and we are hoping as clinicians that this would be uh, 
the situation very soon is that we are able to test massively and widespreadly. And in that case, if you have somebody who has symptoms, uh, respiratory symptoms, I think that they should be tested, isolated in terms of source control and tested as soon as possible. Now, in terms of when they go to the hospital, they should be going to the hospital if they need medical care that can't be provided at that institution. But um, I think that definitely, I think uh, testing those patients would take, would take preference right now over asymptomatic patients who are in the community. But also, I think that ultimately, we really want to make an impact on the epidemic. We have to be able to test everybody who has symptoms or people that, that we are suspecting exposures. Yeah, the, the CDC okay. website does give guidance very specifically about what to do in those instances. And the first is um, high level of suspicion and uh, if possible to geographically isolate those patients with testing when it's possible. Um, again, I think everybody's desire is that we can do the nasopharyngeal swabs, but we know the testing kits aren't available as necessary. I would again refer back to the CDC website um, that has, gives very specific guidance to um, long-term care and skilled nursing facilities. Um, there is, uh, I, again, the recommendations are primarily geographic isolation, um, supportive care uh, for as long as it can um, occur within the facility and not necessarily sending them to the emergency department. Yeah, I think the other thing to keep in mind with those patients is the characteristics of the available PCR test. <clears throat> so the weakness of this type of test is in ruling out disease. It's very, you know, if it's positive, it's very likely the disease is present, but it doesn't have tremendous power for ruling it out. So, you know, while it's great to have a definitive answer, even if the patient gets tested, you still need to practice, you know, thorough hygiene, PPE, and geographic isolation if possible. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from an emergency medicine colleague that uh, I'll summarize as, given this crisis situation, do we need some kind of framework whereby there's a mechanism for being able to very rapidly assess the, you know, the otherwise well patients who really don't need acute care, just getting them kind of out of the way of, of the engine that needs to care for these really sick patients? Absolutely. And I think that you know, if you're in a community, the, the, the best solution is going to vary depending on local variables and the size of your department and what, you, what your situation is. Weather permitting, I think the ideal solution is to screen patients out of doors and to put respiratory, you know, divide your department into essentially two sections. One section where you're caring for people who have, you know, substantive risk of COVID-19 and then an acute care area where you're caring for other patients. And I do think if you're overwhelmed with a surge of people, it certainly makes sense to aggressively try and screen out people that don't require ED or hospital level care. And you know, it's something we discussed earlier today on the ED call. And you know, I'm not sure who's raising that question, but if you wanna talk about it in detail, I think reaching out to the EM senior team is a good idea. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> a couple of people have asked about a scenario where there are no dedicated stethoscopes in the rooms of patients who have been isolated for COVID-19. Any specific recommendation in terms of how to deal with one's own stethoscope if forced to use it? Well, I think that you would have to, um, if you need, I mean, I, I obviously I would minimize it to what's really essential. I mean, I think that as clinicians, I mean, obviously I, 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 I was trained in value uh, the symbolism of clinical exam, but I think that unless you are trying to answer a very specific question, uh, and a lot of times it can be minimized the use. And if you have to use your stethoscope, uh, definitely make sure that you disinfect it with appropriate, I mean, alcohol wipes thoroughly after 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 use. But ideally, you would want to have dedicated stethoscopes for these patients. I agree. Yeah, I would echo what Sergio says. I think that unless your asculatory exam is going to make a difference in your clinical management, I would consider using things like pulse ox and respiratory rate and avoid the use of your personal stethoscope unless you think it's going to alter, you know, an intervention. 
I know we're at the top of the hour. Um, Nate. Big Sergio. Final comments. 